Onesimus by Dr. Earl White, Colossians chapter 4, verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Tychus was commissioned by Paul to deliver this epistle to the Colossians. He was accompanied by Onesimus, who was a runaway slave from a Colossi to Rome. And with this epistle, he bears a private letter to Philemon, his owner. So Onesimus is returning to his owner to re-enter the household of his master, but he does it with an epistle from Paul that explains his conversion. As we study the life of Onesimus, let's notice the following. The Master of Onesimus The master's name is Philemon. He was he owned Onesimus. He is an offended businessman. It is believed that Onesimus not only ran away from Philemon, but also robbed him in the process. Philemon is a saved man converted under the ministry of Paul. Philemon chapter 1 verse 19. But Onesimus was not a saved slave when he left. Therefore, this Christian businessman would not look at it the same way as if Onesimus had been a Christian. And Onesimus did not look look at it like he did after he became a Christian. Philemon had a right by law over Onesimus, even after his conversion. Becoming a Christian does not free us from our legal obligations. And next we see the departure of Onesimus. The Schofield Bible says in the introduction to the book of Philemon, Onesimus, a slave of Philemon, a Christian of Colossae, had robbed his master and fled to Rome. His departure was not like the departure of the prodigal son. The prodigal departed with the reluctant permission of his father. Onesimus robbed his master and bolted, as Guy King says in his book on Colossians. There is no indication of what he robbed his master of, but that he robbed him is universally accepted. Stealing is another word for robbery, and it was a common practice in those days as much as it is now. Many missionaries have testified to me that the nationals where they minister believe that they are doing nothing wrong if they take what they need, especially if you have more than one of the items that they take. After all, a lady doesn't need two earrings that are exactly alike. And why would you think stealing a spare tire was stealing? You don't need the spare tire. You're not using it. Paul had to instruct Christians in this matter. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. The Ephesians past is recognized in the word stole. The conversion of the Ephesians is seen in the instruction steal no more. The lifestyle of the Christian is seen in the words, but rather let him labor, working with his hand, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Onesimus was a man with a past, but it is good to be able to report about the conversion of Onesimus. Now let's, now how this took place, I'm not for sure. He made it to Rome. Somehow he learned that Paul was a prisoner in this place. He may have met Paul when he was in the home of Philemon. Or on the other hand, someone may have found him and brought him to Paul, who then led him to Christ. All we know for sure is that Onesimus became a new man in Christ. Man does not become a Christian gradually. Jesus is confrontational. One must face his sins. He must face his destiny. Onesimus did this. He no doubt was burdened by the weight of sin. He was a runaway slave and the law was not on his side. He was not only a runaway, he was a thief. 
And as we look back, he had to be under conviction. Because no man can come to Christ without being under conviction. Onesimus could run away from Philemon, but he could not run away from God. God was on his trail. Do you remember Jonah? He discovered that God was in the other direction also. I'm not for sure how it took place, but the good part of this story is that it did take place. Onesimus was in the presence of Paul. He told Paul his story, and Paul told him of Christ. He told him he would have to repent of his sins and trust Jesus to forgive him. Onesimus must have said, But what about my past? What will I do about it? Paul must have said, First, let Jesus take care of your past. He will forgive you. For now, don't worry about Philemon. You have sinned against God before you sinned against Philemon. God is more important. Get it right with him. Onesimus must have asked, How do I do that? Paul must have said, Pray right now and confess to him that you've sinned against him and tell him that you are receiving Jesus as your personal Savior. Ask him to forgive you and when you do, believe that he is faithful to forgive. I believe Onesimus did just that. He did repent of his sins and ask the Lord to forgive him. And now we have the new Onesimus. Not only was his destiny changed, but his attitude toward authority changed. After his prayer, I believe that he felt the burden of sin depart. I think he must have said, I have never felt this way before. I know what I did. It, it, it's history, and I can't change it. But I no longer feel the way I felt about this just before I prayed. Brother Paul, I can't explain this wonderful feeling. Suddenly it dawned on him that he had called Paul brother. He looked to Paul to see if Paul approved. And Paul said, Onesimus, you are my brother now. We are in the same family together. We are equals in Christ. I think Paul's remark just about did Onesimus in. I read the biography of John Jasper, who was a converted slave in Richmond, Virginia, and he was converted while working in a busy tobacco factory. It happened at the table as he steamed tobacco. He shouted to the glory of God, and it was heard all over the place. When the overseer heard it, he came in with a whip in his hand and asked him what was going on. He explained in his own way that he had just been saved. The foreman told him to go back to work or suffer the consequences of the whip. He did, but it wasn't long before the owner, who had heard the outbreak in the factory, called John in to talk to him personally. John said, Mr. Sam asked me what just happened out in the factory. John said, when he asked me, his voice was soft, like it seemed to have a little song in it when he played into my, which played into my soul like an angel's harp. I asked him, Mr. Sam, have I ever given you any trouble? John said, he looked at me with tears in his eyes and said, no, John, you never did. Then I began crying and said to him, Mr. Sam, ever since the 4th of July, I've been crying after the Lord, and just now, out there at the table, God took my sins away and set my feet on a rock. I didn't mean to make no noise, Mr. Sam, but before I knew it, the fire broke out in my soul, and I just had to let go one shout to the glory of my Savior. John continues his story. Mr. Sam was sitting there with his eyes toward the floor, And with a quiver in his voice, he said very slow, John, I believe that way myself. I love the Savior that you've just found and want to tell you that I'm not complaining about the noise you made. Then Mr. Sam did a thing that nearly made me drop to the floor. He got up out of his chair and walked over to me and gave me his hand and said, John, I wish you mighty well. Your Savior is mine 
and we are brothers in the Lord now. And when he said that, I turned around and put my arm against the wall and put my fist in my mouth to keep from shouting again. Then as Mr. Sam's face was raining tears, he said, John, you needn't work any more today. I give you a holiday. After you get through telling your story in the factory here, go up to your house and tell your mother. Then go around to your neighbors and tell them. Then go everywhere you want and tell them the good news. It will do you good and it will do them good to hear you honor the Lord and Savior. As John Jasper took wings and flew for the Savior until the day of his death. This is from the biography called Rhapsody in Black by Richard Ellsworth Day. I think something like that happened to Onesimus. He was a new man, and he was not about to keep it a secret. Next we see the recommendation of Paul. Paul tells Onesimus that the right thing to do is go back to Philemon and make things right. Now that advice is received positively by Onesimus, which is an indication that real change has taken place and that he has humbled himself under a new authority. I think Onesimus may have said, Brother Paul, you know I've been on the run for a long time. I've been dreading the thought of getting caught. Now what you're telling me seems to be the very thing I should do. It is a strange feeling I have, but it is good and it is right and I will go back. Paul says, I won your master to the Lord just like I won you, Philemon. Your master recognizes the same authority that you now recognize. I would like you to go back, but I can't go with you. You see my chains? That's impossible. But I will go with you in this letter. I'll ask Philemon to receive you, and we will trust the Lord to work in his heart, and that he will honor this decision. And next we see the return of Onesimus. How many of us would return after a successful escape? Especially if you were a slave and you were about to return to your master from you, from whom you had robbed and had no way of repaying the debt. We know this was true because of what Paul says to Philemon in Philemon one eighteen: If he hath wronged thee, or oweth the ought, put that on mine account. Onesimus couldn't pay, so Paul assumes the responsibility of the debt. This is real-life illustration of the grace of God. We have robbed God of his glory, and we can't repay it. Jesus found us and forgave us and sent us with a letter of recommendation to the Father with his request. Put Earl White's debt on mine account. Well, amen, someone hold my mules. This return speaks of two important things. First, it is a manifestation of the submission of the new convert to the new authority. For a person to claim salvation and then turn around and begin to argue with the authority of the scriptures is an indication he did not understand what he was doing when he professed to know Christ. We are not saved because we depart from God's authority and act independently of him. Salvation is a return to the authority of the throne. Second, it is an act of faith. Onesimus faced one of the greatest tasks in his life. Go back and face a man who had the power of life and death. He trusted what Paul said, equal to the word of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, and committed himself to the Lord who was able to work in Philemon's heart to be merciful on him. Onesimus knew that Paul's advice was right. He acted in faith and did what was right with the willingness to suffer the consequences of, do- of right doing. Then we see...